If you've seen any of his work, you'll know that Denis Villeneuve is one of those directors that finds a way to infuse meaning into every aspect of his films. He has a level of stylistic polish that's matched only by his attention to detail, and I think his 2013 movie Enemy exemplifies this. Everything, from its nightmarish score to its motifs or use of color, is carefully crafted and deliberate. They're pieces of an equation that elevates and nuances the movie's themes. And it's important to remember this, that this is a pattern that repeats itself. Before we get into Enemy, I'd like to mention that this video will contain spoilers, so if you haven't seen it, proceed at your own risk. I'll also say that I made this video with the people that have seen the movie in mind, so I won't go too deep reviewing the plot. However, what I do believe is worth saying is that Denis Villeneuve has explicitly told us what this film is about. Uh, it's a very simple story. It's a man who decides to, uh, to leave, his, leave his mistress to go back to his pregnant wife, and we see the story from his subconscious point of view. So it's, it's like really a, a surrealistic movie, and it's a thriller. He also plants many visual hints to support this, like history books in Anthony's apartment or his mother's point of view. I don't like blueberries. Of course you do. Knowing this, it's easier for us to suspend our disbelief about the film's surrealism and instead explore its depth. This isn't a movie about its narrative, it's about its characters. And with that in mind, let's begin. What's the first thing you noticed as the movie opened? It wasn't the hallway of the sex club, or a very pregnant Helen on her bed. I'm willing to bet it was something much simpler, namely a color, yellow. It's worth starting off by saying that yellow isn't a happy color. It's quite the opposite. Typically, all yellow environments produce stress and anxiety in an audience. In Enemy, Anthony's world is bathed in tones of a nauseating yellow. The omnipresent color evokes contamination, or rot, and implies a concealed threat. It's key to Villeneuve's world building from which nothing escapes. Even nature looks decayed and the city alien. When night falls, the sulfurous yellow gives way to a deeper, saturated orange, which evokes an even graver toxicity. The chemical color intrudes on our characters as they sleep and gives it an artificial, almost sentient quality. The permanence of this color palette creates a surreal consistency which emanates from Adam's worldview, and by extension, Anthony's as well. Adam's life is dominated by his routine and his relationship. Work, commute, fuck, repeat. His lectures are repetitive and centered around the dictatorial obsession for control. Every dictatorship has one obsession. Which doubles as a commentary on his own life. He feels suffocated, which were often shown visually. The monotony of his existence is both repetitive and unsettling, which is underlined by this hellish yellow world. And just as Anthony's existence intrudes on this monotony, so do the film's contrasting colors. Villeneuve uses contrasting colors to interrupt the film's consistency and throw Adam, and by extension us, off balance. The visual clashes are thematically relevant and allow us to enter the minds of his characters without dialogue. For example, the color blue is used sparingly throughout the film, but immediately draws our eyes, as it's directly discordant to yellow. My point of view is that blue represents Adam and Anthony's obsession, their pursuit of information, and therefore each other. The color first commands our gaze when Adam witnesses his doppelganger in the film his colleague recommended. The moment dislodges Adam from his monotonous routine and marks Enemy's first reveal. That same night, the pulsing light from his computer beckons him further into his obsession and is there on every step of his downward spiral. You have the blue in the computer screen, the search engine, even a small light at the video store. This one in particular also serves to guide our eyes towards the poster behind it, but we'll get to that later. The point is the use of discordant colors in the film helps show Adam's break from normalcy as he steps into a more surrealistic world. The color blue has an almost hypnotic quality to it, like an anglerfish in the abyss. But contrasting colors aren't the only trick up Villeneuve's sleeve to make us wear his character's shoes. The use of light and dark in Enemy serves an even deeper purpose, which leads us to 
chiaroscuro, and do forgive the pronunciation. In art and cinema, chiaroscuro is the use of strong contrasts between light and dark, usually bold enough to affect an entire composition. Enemy uses chiaroscuro to elevate the subtext of the film and provide perspective as to the mindset of its characters. That's crazy. <laughs> For example, movement between barriers of light and darkness follow Anthony and Adam's ambivalence of mind. When they make pivotal decisions, their characters fall into positions of deep uncertainty, which we experience visually. Here, Villeneuve uses ambiguous decor like the movement of blinds to convey temptation seeping into Adam's thoughts. And as he succumbs to it, he steps forth into darkness, implying his unavoidable mental tailspin. But the significance of Chiaroscuro is at its peak in scenes where both Adam and Anthony are in the same here? room, which only happens twice throughout the film's 90 minutes. Let's jump forward to their first physical encounter at the unnamed, dilapidated motel. Anthony arrives first, both excited and fearful. He presents himself against the light as Anthony arrives. I told you. His contrasting silhouette is dark and imposing, which reflects how he wishes to appear. But as their encounter unfolds, Adam cowers back as Anthony advances towards him. This pushes Adam into daylight, making him blend with the background and appear meek, visually submissive. Because of this, Anthony takes complete control over the scene. When they compare hands, his are higher and steady and he drives the conversation forward akin to an interrogation. You do, don't you? The result of this scene is an overwhelming feeling of intrusion. I think I made a mistake here. Which is generated by the conjunction of Adam and Anthony's formerly distinct worlds. It's worth noting that this form of communication through lighting happens identically during their second encounter, which cements both how deliberate and how effective it is. And Chiaroscuro's storytelling capacity isn't limited to Adam and Anthony. Helen and Mary are also lit according to their characters. Helen typically appears bathed in a whiter light, which makes her presence calming. It's the only thing that gives us relief from the film's hellish yellows. And Mary is precisely the opposite. She's often cloaked in darkness. She's a personification of what Anthony fears and desires. This dynamic between Anthony and the film's women is extremely important to understanding its message. Before we go further, I think it's important to talk about the film's imagery, as it enhances its themes and gives us context into Anthony's character. There's one theme in particular that dominates the film from start to finish. Women. Women are a point of contradiction for Anthony. They appear as both an object of desire and subjugation. I don't want to get anything. It was a man! It was a man! From the opening of the movie, Helen's pregnancy is associated with rain and a cause for flight. The connection between women and spiders is clear, as they often appear together, even at times superimposed. Anthony feels trapped in their webs. He can't resist his sexual impulses, even if they mean his destruction. My wife. But the thematic significance of women goes beyond Anthony's sexuality. There's a clear association to his feeling of powerlessness, which is often communicated to us visually. For example, in the video store, behind that contrasting blue light that guides our eyes, we find a poster for Attack of the 50-Foot Woman which depicts, well, a woman towering over a city. This motif recurs throughout the film. For example, as Anthony stalks Mary to her place of work, the posters there all feature women overlooking a metropolis as well. Villeneuve deliberately shifts our focus on the background to help us notice these. We don't actually see Mary for most of this sequence, which allows our eyes to wander and notice what's there. The imagery of colossal women connects the figurative dots from sexuality to dominance and control, which helps other not-so-subtle moments make sense. For example, Anthony's uncomfortable fixation on high heels implies this feeling of suppression and powerlessness. One of the posters in the previous scene even shows a woman wearing them stepping on a building. In a figurative sense, he feels squashed and controlled, which explains the film's opening dream sequence. 
Anthony finds a strange gratification by experiencing a reversal of this imagery, wherein the spider is the one who's squashed. But why spiders? Why do they inspire Anthony's terror? It's because of their webs, not their bite. Anthony's fear is rooted in losing control. The idea that his life is just an inescapable cycle of repetition is hell. As such, the motif of the web visually lurks throughout the film. It's true. It appears from the get-go in the city's twisting cables, trapping the commuters below. We also see webs in Adam's dream sequences, and even his mother's artwork echoes those sticky filaments, as do Adam's blackboard etchings on Chaos and Order. And amongst those etchings, one stands out in particular, which sheds light on much of what unfolds before us. Thesis plus antithesis equals synthesis. The importance of this formula is reinforced 33 minutes later, when the board is covered by a dialectic analysis between freedom and security. Let me explain, just to save you a Google search. In philosophy, dialectics is a method of extracting truth from arguments. At its core, it takes a thesis, an idea, and an antithesis, an opposing reaction, and adds tension between them. The resolution of this tension is called the synthesis. So why is this central to enemy? Well, like we've said, the movie is about Anthony's subconscious, which he explores through different personifications of his identity. Adam is a physical manifestation of that subconscious. The thesis is Adam, an idea of what Anthony could be, but Anthony believes him to be weak, monotone, and trapped. He's an expression of what Anthony fears he might become. Adam isn't a womanizer or a superstar actor, he's just a disimpassioned history teacher whose existence is ordinary. The antithesis is Anthony, who's driven by his impulses and personal desire, unconcerned by the pain he inflicts. He's much more animalistic. I am fucking crazy! I'm fucking crazy! When faced with responsibility, he flees. Okay, I don't want to get into this. I'm going for a walk. The simple existence of these two characters suggests a fault in the universe that must be corrected. This is the tension. Anthony seeks to resolve this tension by using it for sexual gratification with Mary. You can give me your clothes in your car. I'm gonna take your girlfriend on a little romantic getaway. I'm gonna bring her back home tomorrow and I'm going to disappear forever. Then we will be even. And Adam sheepishly attempts to do the same with Helen, which is extremely out of character. Sorry. This exchange of lives is marked by the loss of physical barriers between both characters. The tweed jacket, the wedding ring, the messy hair, it all vanishes. The story returns to familiar settings like the motel or Anthony's apartment, echoing events that have already occurred. Watching this unfold is jarring, as both characters are now physically intruding on each other's lives. If the lines between their identities were blurred, they're now completely vandalized. The tension is resolved through Anthony's metaphorical destruction and the reconciliation of Adam's figurative self into Anthony's physical body. So now that this crisis is resolved, Anthony and Helen lived happily ever after, right? Not quite. There's one last thing I omitted to mention about dialectics and why it's such an important concept for this film. The dialectic process is not a journey from point A to point B, it's an endless process through which we get closer to the truth without ever fully grasping it. It's a cycle. And infinite, mundane, controlling repetition is the one thing Anthony fears the most. Repetition is hell. This brings us to the film's terrifying conclusion, where we realize that the entire movie has been a prelude for its final frames. Anthony's internal growth comes crumbling down as temptation rears its ugly head, manifested through the arrival of a tiny silver key. There's a devastating realization as we piece together the echoes from the film's beginning and its end. Hello, darling. It's your mother. I forgot to tell you that your mother called. I'll probably call her back. That this moment has happened before. Are you lying to me? and it will happen again. 
Alan, did you plan on doing something tonight? Because I think I have to go out. It's why Helen takes the form of a terrified spider, because in the end, no matter how much he believes it, Anthony isn't trapped by the women in his life, but by himself. He is the spider and the fly. He is the enemy. Thanks for watching. Enemy is my favorite film of Villeneuve's, followed closely by Prisoners, so this was really a blast to make. It's such a good movie, one you can really keep coming back to and notice something new every time. Just don't get trapped in the cycle. Let me know what you thought. Are there any details that I missed? I'd love to discuss them down below. Till next time.